very pleased to uh, welcome you to this presentation by Don Sear. From me, uh, Don Sear has taught Acadian history and culture courses at UMPI for 35 years. He's completed his coursework for PhD in history and has photographed the structure of pioneer homes in the St. John Valley for 40 years. His PhD work is in the fields of material culture, U.S. history, Canadian studies, and anthropology, all of which are necessary to study the writing of history by using artifacts and architecture to interpret pioneer styles. John is the president of the Musée Culturel du Mont Carmel and an adjunct instructor in history and art at the University of Maine at Presque as well as an art instructor at the Maine School of Science and Mathematics. And Don will be presenting tonight on the evolution of the Madawaska Settlement Pioneer House from shelter to elite status, as well as how it was adapted to the lives of its inhabitants as their circumstances change. The lecture will center mostly on images of homes from the valley, most of which have Please. Four altars. Yes. <laughs> Please help me in welcoming Don Seale. I'm going to tell you you're real troopers to come out yes. tonight. I really, I came up, I was in the limestone, top until limestone until five. I came from Caribou and came up 161 and thought, I bet when I get there they're going to say that it's canceled. Or when, I, when I get home I'm going to fight on my phone with that that it was canceled, but it wasn't, thank God, because uh, I think it's better better this way. The roads aren't as bad as we thought they were. It's not breathing, so that, that helps a lot. Well, for the, uh, what I'm going to be doing is uh, be showing you an awful lot of images. And I'm going to be showing you some transparencies and some slides. Transparencies will always be about in black and white, and the slides will always be in color because Back when I started this, I took lots of images. I had always went around with two cameras, one with black and white film and one with color film. Because uh, back when, in the 70s and the 80s, if you took color slides, they could fade. The color could fade out of them. So I thought, well, I'll take some black and white uh, pictures at the same time because they're more archival at the time. And so I've been, what I've been doing is photographing every old house I can find mostly on the eastern part of the valley because that's where the oldest houses are, number one. And number two, it's closer to home because I live in the eastern part of the valley. So, you know, practical things there. Uh, and uh, the slides I'm going to be showing you uh, is how far I went till about 10 years ago. So there are lots of images I've taken in the last 10 years that are not included in those. So there are lots of things that I've been going more into the western side of the valley. I was fortunate enough to be um, hired by the Maine Historic Preservation Commission back around 94, 95, 1994, 1995, to do a farm study, to do a survey of all the farms in Worcester County. And I started down at Danforth, and I worked my way up using the USGS maps, crossing off every road, on those maps, it shows every building and visiting every farm in Worcester County. And it took about five years to do it. And uh, every and I had to take uh, shots of every building that was over 75 years old. Uh, and, and for every farm, it had to have two of the three, which could be an old farmhouse, a data house, or a barn. If it had two of those, then I would photograph it. But I photographed it, it was, it was just one of those. So I, you know, it did a complete uh, thing. And I went, uh, I visited 897 farms, I think it was, in that five years. And they wanted two photographs of each farm or whatever. But you couldn't photograph three buildings in two photographs. And some, some, some farms I took 30 photographs. And ended up doing the sheets, you had to paste the images on. We did contact sheets. And 
and contact strips and just did, you know, like thumbnails of it. And some, I had to go on to the back. And, so I really overdid it. Uh, but what happened is I got to visit every farm in Worcester County and got to see how the archi architecture changed. There are really three districts in the county, and they're obvious. South, Central, and North. No revelation there. But in the South, most of the farms have Cape-style houses. And then uh, from Holton up to the valley, uh, lots of Victorian farms with Victorian structures. And then once you get to the valley, you get back to Cape-style houses and Victorian houses mixed. But the Victorian is more French Victorian. Or Eugenie, or you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. And um, the only brick farmhouses in Aroostook County are in the valley. There are three of them. One on each end. One in Hamlin, and one in uh, uh, yeah St. John, I guess would be the yeah. And another one in the back side of the middle west. And uh, and, the, and in here in the valley, there's the most variety in the whole thing. But in the process of visiting all of these, I got to see where the log houses were. And uh, and here in the valley, there are lots of buildings that are 150, 200 years old, and when you look at it, you think they were built in the 1950s. Because, tout nouveau, tout beau, right? Everything that's new is beautiful, which is horrible to historic preservation. That's the worst thing you want to hear, because what it means is stripping off all the old stuff and making it look new. And once you strip the old stuff off, you can't put it back. Because whatever you put back is fake. Once it's gone, it's gone. You can replace it on the spot. There's something rotten. You can replace it on the spot. You strip all the moldings off, and then you say, well, I'll put it back. You never know, because the moldings are different. Even a cold molding over 100 years is different. That kind of thing. So unfortunately, a lot of these places, you, you never know. And I know a few people that have uh, said, well, you know, I wanted to put in a picture window in my house, and you know, I had to use a chainsaw. Because <laughs> they had to go through these old logs right. to do it, and they never knew they lived in a log house, they just knew it was snug. So, so what we have here, our old, our old houses here in, in the valley are uh, hand-hewn square log houses. Now, I say hand you. I should just say square log houses because some are hand you and some are sawn. Okay? But these houses do not have projecting corners. They're either uncut emballage, which means there's a post, and it's time you move logs into that post, or piece over piece, piece over piece, which, well, piece over piece like that, but they're dovetailed like a bureau drawer. Okay? With no projecting corners. And it would be that way for a few years. And then they would take uh, thick pine boards, again, tongue and groove, vertically over those logs in order to make it more snug. And sometimes those boards going over those logs, they're, they're very rarely square. They're sometimes 14 inches on the top and 10 inches on the bottom. But the next one is the opposite. So they would turn end over end, okay? Uh, so that it would come out fairly square. And, and then over that, they would either put a bandeau, uh, clapboards, excuse me, shingles, or clapboards. And when you, when you see it, it's like the Dubai house here in Fort Kent, that's a long house. Uh, but you don't really know it by seeing it, okay? Uh, and so, and then they did the same thing on the interior. So they put vertical tiny and groove pine boards. And a lot of these boards are, uh, are hand planked. And in the province of Quebec, where there are 200,000 of these houses, uh, a lot of people are restoring these houses. And uh, you can buy boards in an antique shop now to do interior. To buy one pine board, very often they're a full inch thick and hydraulic saw marks on the back, and then hand planing on the front, and sometimes they're just wide, sometimes wider, 
and it costs about three hundred dollars more. During the valley, people are burning the houses down. There's one here in Fort Kent that we burned just a little while ago. Yeah. An old log house with those boards on the inside and the inside. And it's just it's it's just a, a shame. Uh, when the National Park Service came up and did their report to Congress, uh, they sent two researchers up. They told me, they said, we think that this area has the highest concentration of log, of square log houses in the nation. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. Yeah. Because so many of them have been destroyed. So it's a shame. Uh, and so when someone does it, I say, oh, I'm so glad you destroyed that house. <laughs> that means that the few that are left are worth much more. <laughs> You're just making other people rich. Yeah. Uh, so, in any case, uh, these uh, houses, could we have the lights down a little bit? Because I want to start showing some of these. Uh, I've got a, a plan here, which I hope it's going to be a juggling match because I've got transparencies and slides. And, uh, yeah. As long as they can see this one on this side. Um, this is the Martin House at the Village Acadia in Quebec. And it was built, it was made in 1763. So this is right at the end of the French and Indian War. Uh, the Treaty of Paris of 1763 uh, took away all the French possessions in North America, except for St. Pierre de Guillaume and uh, Guadeloupe and Balsinique in, in the uh, Caribbean. And the French were free to go wherever they wanted. And uh, a lot of uh, Acadians who will end up in this region are from the Beaubassin region of you know, what's now Nova Scotia. And uh, they will uh, go along the St. John River, all the way from St. John, because the violets are down at St. John on, on the uh, the kind of cases for me. And uh, all the way up to what's now uh, almost King's Landing. Uh, at the, the dam at Mactaquac. Just down from that dam is Crocs Point. It's a beautiful piece of land. But that was owned by Jean-Baptiste Sire. And he had seven, he had nine sons, and seven of them will become Madawaskans eventually. Five of them is up in 1985. And and the other two uh, right after. And uh, beautiful, beautiful land, but what happens with the loyal when the loyalists start coming in uh, at the end of the American Revolution, uh, these Acadians get pushed out. Uh, they are compensated for the clearing the land, but they have tasted the uh, they have tasted ownership of land. Because in their culture, a lord always owned the land. And he was supposed to collect rent for that land, but they never did because it was a bother. And the lords were doing well in the fur trade, so they didn't bother collecting rents. So the Acadians in Acadia uh, grew up with the idea that land was just there and you squat on it and it's yours. You know, paperwork? What's that? Okay? And uh, so when they when they get in the lower St. John, they think they're there that they're, that's where they're going to stay. And then when the Loyalists come in, and of course in, in New Brunswick, in 17 before when New Brunswick becomes our province or becomes a uh, colony, uh, they uh, purposely bring Loyalists and put them on the west side of the St. John River to be sure that those revolting Americans would pun up. Those revolting Americans. Okay? Those revolting Americans don't don't claim all the way to the St. John River, all the way to St. John Brunswick, which we tried to do. Okay, and uh, so uh, they then petitioned for land to come up to the Madawaska territory, and and they're given also some of them are given land in Karakak, calling really their divides in half through Karakak and the Madawaska territory. And some families like the Seer family, the nine sons, two of them go to Karakak and the other seven end up in the Madawaska territory. Incidentally, those Seer, those Seer sons, their wives actually had 120 children. 
each. <laughs> you know, they used to say that up around here, you shake a bush and a rabbit would fall off. Well, you shake a bush and an Acadian would fall off. But uh, if you shake a bush now, the rabbits are falling off again. Because uh, we're not doing our duty. Uh, but it, and I'm certainly not doing my duty, that's for sure. Uh, so what happens is uh, they, when they go to the area, they continue building the way they have built all along because it's folklore. Folklore is a way of life. It's how you live. It's your complete education by ear. Okay? Everything. How you, your, how you organize your thoughts, riddles, songs, stories, food, clothing, architecture, furniture. It's all folklore. Okay? And the depth of folklore is brought out by the diversity within it. And you're gonna find, in this presentation, you're gonna be seeing all log houses, but every one is gonna be different. Every one, even though they, they seem like rubber stamps, every one is gonna be different. Because there are problems that have to solve. How do you join the corners? If you don't know dovetails, how do you do it? How do you put it on the roof? It's easy to put on a roof, when the eaves don't project over the, you see how the eaves project up here? It's easy to do it when they don't do that. But when they do do that, how do you make it do that? Do you, do you take the way they do it in Quebec? Or do you do it the way they do it in Acadia? And how steep is the roof? They don't seem to have the ability to make any angle different than a 45 degree angle for the roof. They're always a 45 degree slope, always. No exceptions. So when you see someone put up a house that's historical and doesn't have a 45 degree roof, it's, it's not, it's wrong, it's totally wrong. And there's, there's just no validity to do it at all, okay? So the other thing is these houses evolve over time, even though they're building houses like this in 1604. And he's saying, what? This is the type of house they're making. Only they're more uncolorable, they believe. And the way Champlain does his drawing, uh, Champlain was a good, good drawer, and, and you learn to interpret his lines. And that's what they're building. And, and it says that a lot of these houses were prefabricated, prefabricated, brought over from France. Especially the windows, the doors, interior paneling, because in the Lord's house, you had panels on the walls, okay? Like you would in a small palace. Uh, even though they might not be as fancy as in a small palace, they're still panels. You know, aristocrats are aristocrats, and they want comfort. And uh, so they're really starting, and, and you look at, you go back into the history, and uh, there's a book called, uh, by Andrew Hill Clark Park called The Geography of Acadia. And it is, it's my Bible. Uh, and that's where, that was the first book I read in Acadian history. And I read it when I was living at the Acadian village in Van Buren. I lived there in 1977 and 1978 in the city office. Actually, I lived in every house on that village. I lived in the Roy house for one week when it was below zero. <laughs> and I did it just to experience it. And I was very happy to get back the 19th century. <laughs> because that place is hard to eat. That place is hard to eat. But, uh, but what happens is, is these houses evolve. Um, what was I talking about to me about the Acadian language? What, what did I say just before that? Coming across geography. Good listeners. That's a trick I use with my students. To make good listeners. <laughs> Trace the thing, because I do, my mind does wander, because everything's so interconnected to the problem. But in any case, um, the, um, what was it again? Windows and doors. Oh yeah, they, they imported all that stuff. They, uh, and so what happens is in the Middle Ages, when you build a house, you build a house, they say it's supposed to be at least 16 feet by 16 feet. Because that's what you needed for an ox. An ox had to be housed in 16 feet by 16 feet. 
And so that's good for family too. Okay? And the way they laid these houses out is they would take rope, they didn't have measuring sticks, they didn't have yard sticks, they did it in cubits and strides and things like that, and you would pace out nine cubits. Okay? And put a string in, you start with a rope, put it down, and then you take another rope, rope the same length, and you would cross it to make a big X. And you wanted as much close to a 90 degree angle as you could get in. And then you then you drew stakes and you connected those corners, and that's your square house. Easy to lay out. But what happens is the houses are never square. <laughs> And I made the mistake when I first started photographing these houses of not measuring them. And I realized only after I tore down the Edwa uh, Violet house um, that it wasn't square because I had to make a plan for it and I had to, to be sure that the sills were back where they should be. And so I did diagonals to make and, and measured them and everything to make sure it was out of square by a foot and a half. But when you're in it, it looks square, okay? So that's the way they laid out the houses. And the, uh, the idea was when you build a house 16 feet by 16 feet, every wall has to have an opening. So you have a drawer, a window, a window, and a fireplace, that's an opening, okay? So if you have to, very often the fireplace would be off to one side rather than on the other end, okay? And then if you have to uh, build onto that, then you can build on any side, as many as you want, the same thing, or you can build up, okay? But you always have rooms the same size, 16 feet by 16 feet, which are the size of the rooms in my house. My house was built in 1996. All the rooms are 16 feet by 16 feet, which I thank God for every day, because I would know it if it wasn't for that. Because I didn't have first option on it. The person that had the option before me wanted to make it into a nursing home. They wanted to divide those rooms. So 16 foot by 16 foot. You cannot divide a 16 foot room. What do you get? Yeah. A closet in a 12 foot by 12, 12 foot by 16 foot room. Uh, an 8 foot by 16 foot room, or four 8 foot by 8 foot rooms. It doesn't work. So I thank God I didn't get for that. Anyway, but that's that's the way they were doing it. And then you'd have your openings on every wall again and continue up from there. But what you end up with is things are not symmetrical. You see there's a door here and a window. Okay, that's the medieval style of building. In the Renaissance, Renaissance was a very male-oriented time. And what do males like better than anything? Symmetricality. You ask a man to decorate a room it will always be symmetrical. They'll always put the bed, night tables on each side, everything will be symmetrical and balanced. Because that's the way males think. Put a female in there, it won't be. It'll be designed with more interest, you know, you won't be able to, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, but that's what happens. In the Renaissance, you get this, this male-dominated kind of thing happening. And, and in Quebec, the houses are that was very heavily influenced uh, by the Renaissance. And uh, you have central door, window on each side. Or two windows on each side. But never three windows in a door. In Acadia, there might be three windows in a door. But not in Quebec. Yeah? No, it's just to say that women had charge of the home in the Middle Ages. And then all this patriarchy thing. In the no, it doesn't mean it wasn't a dominant because mm -hmm. it always it's been male dominated since 35,000 years ago, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but the women's sphere was the home. And it still is, but the men are building the homes. Well they always did. So I guess you can argue it any way you want. I can talk myself, get around it anyway. Uh, but that's the idea. The the idea is symmetricality. Okay? Now, in 
the, our region here, we have the influence from Acadia and the influence from Quebec. Because these families that came up from Ikupak, from St. Don de Cayiba, whatever you want to call it, uh, are uh, in many instances Acadian males with French Canadian wives. How they got those wives, we don't know. <laughs> Very good. Uh, there's been, you know, there's been a lot of research to try to find out, and a lot of surmising that they, from from the Saint John River, they went to Kamouraska region and lived there for a while and got married and then came back to Saint John River and they got pushed out. But when Beatrice Craig was doing her book, The Land in Between, um, she had me go to Quebec. I spent a week in the archives in Quebec, going through the church records, the seigneurial records, the probate court records, everything for that whole region from 1755 to 1785. I did not find one Acadian name in those registers. Not one. You would think that if they came up there, they would have left some evidence behind. Someone's going to die. Someone's going to marry. Someone's going, you know, there's going to be some record left if they're there, you'd think. But who knows? I do know that in my family, a seer, there's a seer in my particular line, there's a seer that marries an ayot. The ayots are from Quebec. But they came down and settled at Ikupak, and that's where they meet. In that instance, I don't know if that's generally the rule or not, but there needs to be a lot of research done there. There's a subject for dissertation there. But in any case, uh, this house was built at Ikupa. It's been moved to the Glaja Kajian Trade. So this was down right at Nakakwak, where Nakakwak ends. It's right down and around there. Right near, there's, there's a church there now. There always was a church there. And that's and why did they settle there? Why are they all settling near Indian villages? They're settling near Indian villages because the missionaries were paid by the King of France to mission to the Indians. The King of France didn't care about the Acadians or the Quebec law. They cared about the natives. Because they were the trading partners. Okay? and they needed church services. They needed at least once a year. So they knew if they came into a region, they would get church services once a year at least. So that's why they settled at Lake Kapak. That's why they settled here at St. Moselle because there's an Indian. The first mass here in the St. John Valley is a full 120 years before any, any Acadian comes here. Okay? So they knew that it would be church service. This was, you know, the river was used as transportation from 1612 on. Champlain wrote a, did a map of the portage route to Quebec through here in 1612. So there's a, there's a lot there. The interesting thing about this, I find, is the daughter of the man who builds this. This is the interior. See the fireplace with the crane? The crane is just a pole going into mid hemlock. This is the hemlock beam in the fireplace. And uh, that pole can swivel out because it's into stone here and into a, a roof beam or a joist. And it swings up like that. And it's far, far enough, this, this goes up about five feet. It's about five feet off the floor. So even though it's sooty, it's not going to, uh, to burn. Uh, if this were closer to the coast, they would have soaked that hemlock beam in salt water for a season. It would wick salt into it and would make it more fireproof. But they, they, they generally didn't burn. Okay? Uh, dirt floor, the only stones are around the hearth. Everything else is a dirt floor. And opposite the fireplace, there's a loft. A sleeping loft or a storage loft. This is the Roy House at the Acadian village of Van Buren. Built by the husband of the daughter 
of the Martin who built the house you just saw. Okay? Now this house was built in Hamlet. We think it was the 1790s. Because Van Buren was settled in 1789, officially. But, you know, there's a problem with settlement around here, the, the people around here, and we still think this way. We're so far from the authorities that we can do what we want. And by the time they catch up to us, we'll have it legal. Okay? They did that in, in St. Brazil when they asked to build a chapel for the Bishop of Quebec. The chapel was built before they asked. And they asked, and he says, okay. They said, and he said, what, what size do you think you can build? They tell him <laughs> what size it is, you know, kind of a thing. They tended to do that kind of thing. And there's evidence, more and more evidence, because again, in those papers that I was checking through for Beatrice Craig, um, the, um, we found a court case in, in the 1780s. It's like 1786 or 1787. I don't remember because I just saw it for a little bit. And when I found that, I had to break the seal because it had never been opened. And no one had ever looked at this. And it was about between Alexandre Dubé and someone else. He was suing someone else. And it was over some property uh, before 1785 because it was coming to court so quickly, you know, so early. And, and so there's, there's reason to believe there's something else. And the other thing, too, is, uh, you know, if you, if you ever watch Survivor, when they get on that island and they have to build a shelter and figure out how to do fire that first day, how do they do? They don't do very well. Okay, that's really was. And, and so, if you want to put a house together, you just call your extended family. And if you have 100 people working on a house, you can put it up in three days. Because you fell the trees, you hand you them square, and I hand him a log square once because I was helping put together the elder house. And uh, it's not hard. It just takes time. It's not hard work, and you don't need a break. You get on, you take the hewing axe, and you chop the sides, and then kind of clear it square. When you get something that's reasonably square, you turn it over, you do the next side, turn it over, do the next side. And, and I found that you had to work almost in a rhythm like this. If you went too fast, it didn't work. If you went too slow, you didn't have enough momentum. But just the right speed was not tiring. And you could, you could do it nonstop. And I had only done it once. I think I hewed that beam, that log, and, and not only when I had the log, I had to hew it from this size to this size because it was in the room. So it was wedge shaped. And it only took a couple of hours. For me, who had never had experience, okay, so they they could really put these together fairly quickly. Yeah. yeah. What about shrimpage when they put them up in the green? What happened down the road? I mean, it... that's why they had to build another house in 20 years. <laughs> yeah. And very often, and that's why this house is the way it is. This is the Roy House. This is the interior of the Roy House. You've seen that fireplace before. You just saw uh, what it looked like in the Martin House. Uh, but this isn't copied from the Martin House. This is copied from the Kono House in St. Basil, which had its fireplace up until 20 years ago. Not anymore. I took it down, which was a shame, because those, those logs are held together not with mortar, diesel to mortar, but those logs in St. Basil held together with clay. They wedged river clay and used clay, and then when they fire up the fireplace, it would bake the clay. Uh, and uh, makes makes a nice uh, fireplace, uh, but you see, it's all all dirt floor. There's no floor in here. Yeah. Now, you said they could erect these in like three days. Yeah. Would they be able to move right in, or did they oh, yeah. have to let it dry? No, they could move right in. Now, if they had full warning, like very often a house was a wedding gift. Anyone who got married got a house. Isn't that nice? But the whole, but it didn't cost anything to build a house. Yeah. The only thing you had to pay for was a few nails for the roof. Okay, and uh, so uh, what you would do is, uh, if you knew that they were, you'd go out and you'd select your trees and you deal in them. 
pine trees, just leave the top two or three branches on them. Deal of them, and it would dry the tree up. So when you cut it down, it wasn't as green. And uh, so, what have gone wrong? I'll go, I'll go faster, I promise. <laughs> this is a house, the house of Louis Cormier at Mount Carmel. You know uh, where the picnic area is? Uh, between uh, Grand Isle and Madawaska, okay? Uh, just down from that, um, there is uh, is where this house used to be. And Louis Cormier was the person who led the separatist movement of the diocese, of the area from the diocese of Fredericton, which is, that's what it was at that time, uh, from the, wanted to join the Diocese of um, Boston, the Archdiocese of Boston. And they petitioned the Pope. The Pope got their petition, and uh, he created the Diocese of Portland and the Diocese of Manchester, New Hampshire, instead of attaching us to Boston. And, uh, but that happened at Mount Carmel. And he was a, one of the people that built that original chapel at Mount Carmel. But uh, this is his house. And you can see the central door. And you have the two windows on each side. This is the older house. And it has a central door and a window on each side. And it becomes the kitchen. Uh, this is uh, a more of a room structure. Probably didn't have a, uh, a plank floor. But when they built this in, they probably raised up and put a floor underneath it, and then lowered it onto the floor. Uh, but the person, I'm not going to say the person who owned, who owned this, uh, but um, he told me, he said, I, uh, I bulldozed that house down. <laughs> he said, I put it into, uh, I dug a hole, and I bulldozed it into the hole. I said, really? He said, yeah, but he says, I saved something on it. I said, really? What did you save? He said, I saved the main register, because Louis Cormier was a registry of deeds for the valley. And he said, I saved the main register. I said, good for you. And I'm thinking, there's one in every library in the state. You know, we didn't save anything. I said, so what kind of stuff was in the house? He said, well, you know, there was a table. And underneath that table, it was marked 1812. Oh, wow. And I said, thank you, Louis. You just made my collection more valuable. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm calling him Louis, but he names But you know, it's a shame that he didn't respect that at all. But he respected the stupid book. Mm. Uh, and <laughs> I shouldn't say stupid book. It's not a, not a unique book anyway. Mm. OK? So this this is really wrong. This was taken uh, probably in the 40s or 50s, 1940s or 1950s. That's a total guess on my part. This is the Alexi Sierra House in St. Basile. And uh, the Alexi Sierra House was built around 1820, we believe. And uh, so this would be the second generation in. And it became an outbuilding or a barn behind the building. It's right near the uh, shopping center in Madawaska uh, Center. Mm -hmm. It's the next house after that center. And the, uh, this house, of course, is still there. And uh, this one will be back there. But that house is uh, probably built in the 1840s or 50s or so. This was the original house. And you can see it has its original fireplace. Mm -hmm. See, it's on Column Bosch. You see, this is next to the door. It's the post going up room. You see the cutting room log going into that. And these are clapboards that are so weather beaten that probably the clapboards are probably 150 years old. When I took this, and I took this in the 60s. No, I didn't take it in the 60s. I took it in the 70s. I wasn't here in the 60s. This is the interior. Again, you can see how they're using, this is really rude. I mean, they're using vertical logs, but here they have two, spacing it out more. This is 
this is meant to be covered up. And these are hand hewn, but barely. <laughs> They're hand hewn flat on each side, but there's a bit of a rounded thing on the top. Uh, these are the armoire that were in here. One the old blue, one the old red. Original condition, never repainted. And uh, when I was there, I just learned after after a while that you just have to be forward sometimes. I should have said, but I'm seeing you want to sell those cupboards? But I didn't. I thought that would be rude to take advantage of the fact that she let me in that building. Yeah. And so when I went back a year later, a cadet dealer had come through uh -huh. and bought them. I bet they paid fifty dollars each for them. Uh, but you see, these are the raised panels. This, one, this one's earlier. I mean, this one's earlier than this one. The raised panels came later. Uh, I mean, the er on the earlier covers they have raised panels, but the raised part is inside the door. That wasn't beautiful. What was beautiful was a beautiful hand plane flat board. Over here, when it becomes a little bit, when they have better tools, then this becomes the more beautiful side. So they start facing them out. But um, I'm not sure the name There was a lot of junk in there. You see here, this is the, uh, you see where they put a stove pipe in and how they weakened that beam doing it. And this is where the crane was. This is looking up the chimney. the same, just disregard the house on the right, it's not the same house, this is still a house, but look at the uh, windows, mm -hmm. it's six over six, yes. which is a bit unusual around here, most often around here it's like this, this is 12, yeah, 12 over eight, the upper part is taller than the lower part which is, seems to be more indicative of this region. These uh, little windows, eight by 10. That size. That's the size we're doing. Think it's coincidence? Huh? An eight by 10 sheet of paper is the size of the windows they used to have. The Greeks. Believe it when I was told this. But the Greeks believe that these divine proportions are from the Parthenon. Okay? And if you take the diagonal of this 8 by 10 sheet of paper, you bring the diagonal down and make it on this size, you end up with an 11, an 8 by 14, 8 and a half by 14 sheet of paper. Those are the proportions of the Parthenon. Okay? And that was considered to be ideal. And then when you bring that side up to make that diagonal, then this is the other option. And this was perfect, the perfect size for when you have blown glass. Because you had to blow glass to make windows. You have to flatten it out and then cut it square. And you couldn't, you couldn't blow it that large. The only place that had large panes of glass was Versailles Palace. And there the panes of glass are like this and they're all hand blown. And there are 450 mirrors in the hall of mirrors that are that size. So that was, a, that was a special place, and they got the very best of everything. But the glass from around here, I have a piece of glass from a house in Saigon. That's from 1792. And uh, that piece of glass is an eight, a sixteenth of an inch on the top and a quarter of an inch on the bottom. Because it's old enough that the glass has flowed. And pretty amazing, all, all wavy glass. And it's, you know, incredible thing. Unfortunately, that house is bulldozed too. Person can only do so much, you know. That's what we say. This is 
was the fireplace and, uh, and the door went out to went out to that porch that you saw earlier. Upstairs in the attic. I went up there with my camera, put on the flash, measured it, paced off the measurement, went down, set my camera, went back up because it was dark, didn't have a flash on it, and took this photo, and then I learned what it looked like when I had the photo developed. But I had no idea what I was taking a picture of. Uh, but you can see the way the logs are uh, joined together in the corner. And there's also an old shoe up here. There's, these walls are not hollow. And the old superstition was they had concealment shoes. In the wall, you would put an old used shoe to ward off the devil. That's an old French tradition which came to England by way of William the Conqueror. And it's an English tradition as well, and it's a tradition that's made it here. In fact, when I was doing some work in my house, I had to replace part of a wall uh, because I wanted to insulate it. And I found a shoe there, and I, I have it, I saved it. But these concealment shoes, again, were, it's a, it's a kind of a superstition, so to speak. I don't want to say that too loud because it sounds so irreverent. But, first open. And you can see the platforms on this are new. Uh, they're not new now. Uh, but what they did is it settled on the bank of a marsh, of a tidal marsh. Uh, originally it was uh, near Mount Carmel on the Canadian side, on the St. Brazil side of the river, and it sat on the river bank, facing the river bank. And I had to find a place on the marsh where the back of the house is facing south. They had to face in the same kind of direction. And so that's what they, they found. Now, the difference between this house and other Indian houses at the village is this one stands out as different from all the others because it has so many more windows. This one has two windows on each side of the door, and on each side, there are two more windows. And then the back looks exactly like the front. The back is exactly the same as the front. And the windows are large. And when you're inside, there's a real feeling of light in there, which you don't find in any of the other houses. The house is built on Kalambaj, which means that you have a corner post. This is a corner, an outside corner. You have a corner post, and the logs go out, and they move into that. And what they do is they, they sheared off the edge of that post so you don't have an inside-out corner, which in some places you do. So that's how they solve the problem, that problem. This is the uh, wood stove. This house was built in 1840. Uh, and the wood stove is made of stone. Uh, it has a plate, a, uh, an iron plate on the top, and an iron door, and a stove pipe. So when they brought this in by canoe, they couldn't bring in the whole stove. They could only bring the important parts, that top plate and the door, and the stove pipe. And the stove pipe has the best damper I've ever seen. What they did is they took a piece of tin and they cut it, the arc of the stove pipe, and it comes out and there's a, a flap that comes down, it's like a handle. And then they saw it halfway through the pipe, 
and stick that in the saw mark, and you can close that completely. So if you have a chimney fire or something, you close that completely, there's no way of getting through there at all. For the dampers we have now are those flimsy things that you still get a draft through no matter what. Best scope I've ever seen. Best, you know, damper I've ever seen. But that's the type that you, and, it, and this would heat, this helps out pretty well. Does the pipe go out the sidewall? No, it goes right up straight. Uh, it goes up into the attic and then it travels the length of the attic and then comes up the other end. They wanted to, they wanted to heat the attic in the winter a little bit. Very often the attic was placed for grain. Sometimes you could freeze meat up there. Yeah? Was it also made of the same material or what was the stove pipe made of? Made of tin. Yeah. yeah. Same, same as the ones we have now. This is the root cellar underneath the house. This ladder goes up to a front door in the kitchen pool. Okay. So you have logs, cedar logs, stand about this high. This is coming in from the cut board. Okay. So you're coming in from the outside here. You get in here, and it's about like this. Space about like this. But the house is much larger. And then from those logs, there's river sand dry river sand that goes right up to the floor so you feel like you're in a funnel. Okay. And so what you do is carrots, parsnips, turnips, you bury in that sand. And it's dry sand so they wouldn't put out roots. And they'd stay fresh. It was like fresh in the garden all winter. Okay, potatoes they would put in barrels. Because potatoes will sprout even in a desert. Okay, but because uh, there's enough moisture in there. But uh, and then in the winter they would cover this over and fill this with straw, and all the vegetables and things you could get to it from the house. That's that's something that every other Acadian region of New Brunswick does not have. That's unique to this region, but it's not unique in Quebec. So that's one of these innovations from Quebec. This is the way the uh, logs are unroofed. Or not telling you, but dovetail on the corners. And they're made so that it can't slip out. You see this angle right here? That keeps it from slipping up that way because the forces coming down on this wall make it seem to want the walls to bulge out if the, if the roof is too heavy. The tongue in groove is. Uh, this is the groove, and this is the tunnel. So this you have a log here, and this one right here fits in. This is not a tiny groove, this is up here. Yeah. This is the Roy house. In, on the at the Acadian village, it's not dovetail on the corners. The, the logs butt up, and then the next log butts up in the other direction. So this is the butt like this here, and this one there, and then it's you see the pig right there, and there's another pig right here. So they're paved on the corners. That's how they solve the problem. Again, variety. Every house. Even though they might look the same, they're different. This is a this is a tongue and groove where the tongues are all separate. You have two boards that meet here. You have a groove here, a groove here, and a separate tongue that slides in between them and hold them together. On two tongue and groove boards, this tongue would be on one board and the groove would be on the other. And the back end of the board would have the opposite of what it has in front. Okay. 